morning, everyone. Good morning. He has risen. Do you, do you really believe that in your heart? Let us stand as we go before him today and let him know all about us, how much we love him. Heavenly Father, we, we just thank you. There's, there's just no words in our language to express what's in our heart. But we know what's in our heart is so real because we believe in the one true God. We believe that he has sent his son Jesus to pay the price that needed to be paid so that we may have forgiveness and be redeemed. Be redeemed and be in your presence. And we give you thanks and praise for that, Lord. Hear our praise as we offer it up to you today. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is good. Amen. All the time, God is good. The tomb is empty. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We're going to try a song to start with this morning that my daughter always sings, so we're going to, we're going to do it because my Savior lives. Amen. Thank you. 
What kind of king rides on a donkey? A donkey that might be borrowed or might be hijacked? What kind of king builds a castle with a wide open door for children to enter, but a needle-eye-sized hole for the rich? What kind of king rides on a donkey into the city where his assassins are waiting? What kind of a king enters his assassin city with her ragtag commotion for all to see, and not one security guard? What kind of king lets his subjects treat him like a military liberator, but doesn't come with a single sword or a weapon? What kind of king lets his followers send a public message to the competing powers with no intent of answering a single challenge? What kind of king are you? What kind of king can send two followers to fetch a donkey and know exactly what they'll need to say. What kind of king can tell a blind beggar, your faith has made you well, and he actually makes him see? What kind of king can weep at the funeral of his friend, only to say, Lazarus, come forth? and watch him come back to life. And what kind of king can sit at the dinner table with his subjects and be subject to them and wash their feet? What kind of king can carry his own cross, can serve his assassin and help in his own execution? What kind of king can die so that his assassins can live? What kind of king are you? A king who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. A king who keeps his promise. A king who I can trust. A king who can save. A king I want to follow. And so I come to you, King Jesus, not to be served by you, but to serve you and to give you my life. So take my cloak, use it to clothe the naked, or use it for your donkey to step on. I don't care, so long as you're the one taking it because you're the only one who will give me a new garment in return, a white robe garment of saints' righteous deeds, a car garment that fits me so well, I'll be a new self, I'll be your self. Use me, King Jesus, all of me as you see fit. Make me a knight or a bishop or a rook on a chessboard or make me an expandable pawn. I don't care what piece I am, so long as yours is the hand that's moving me. Because yours is the mighty hand with an outstretched arm. Yours is the hand that rules with an iron scepter that knit me together in my mother's womb. So let me follow you, King Jesus, all the way to Golgotha. Let me walk next to you and put palm branches at your feet and shout, Hosanna, with the children. And if the child in me shouting, Hosanna, grows up to an adult, shouting, Crucify, bring me back to the water where I can be born again. Let me sit at the table with you and take bread and wine from your hands. Let me lay my head at the foot of, on your chest. And if 30 pieces of the world's silver are ever enough to drop me, draw me away, wash my feet and make me clean again. Let me pray with you at Gethsemane and learn from you how to be vulnerable with the Father 
Let me see your tears and sweat and grief. And if my prayers give way to sleep, wake me again with the waters of regeneration. Let me walk with you to the cross. Let me be Simon of Cyrene and learn to carry your cross with you. And if my Simon of Cyrene becomes Simon Peter and I walk away from your cross to deny you, lead me back to these waters where I can still die with you. And live. And all along this long rough road, let my song be. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest, King Jesus. Deep in her heart, I call him 
just a man Deep in her heart She knew from the start Somehow her son Would live see the sun come out. Yes. Wow. And I'm so glad that everyone is here with us today to be together to celebrate the resurrected Lord. I'm so glad you're here for that. I'm, I'm taking back to a story that Dr. David Jeremiah shared about the teacher that asked the students to bring a little empty uh, egg, plastic egg, with something maybe they would represent inside of it Easter. So the little children brought their little plastic eggs and she would open them one by one. She opened the little girl's egg and it had a flower in it. And she thought, well, that represents Easter for sure. And then another child had brought a, a, a plastic egg with a nail in it. And the nails that put Christ on the cross representing that. A little special needs child brought his egg too. And when the teacher opened it up, it was empty. And the teacher said, well, Johnny, what, what, what was you trying to empty? The grave was empty. Wow. That was a beautiful story, I thought. Let's rejoice and reflect on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Rejoice and reflect. Our message will be centered on those thoughts. Father, thank you today for speaking to us as you already have, but continue to speak to our hearts through the message today as we close our time together. And we thank you in Christ's name and everybody said, and George started it off this morning, but we'll do it again. Christ is risen. Yes, that's the response. Christ arose, and he is Lord. Christ arose, our salvation is sure. Christ arose, and we will rise also. Christ arose, he is Lord. 
And Romans 1, 4, and declared to be the Son of God with power by the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Christ arose. Our salvation is sure. Of 1 Corinthians 15. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. You're back in your sins. But now, verse 20, but Christ is risen from the dead. Everybody rejoices. Christ arose and we shall rise also. And has Christ become the first fruit of millions now dead will come back to life again someday because Christ is from the dead the first fruits of those that are brought back to life. And by contrast to those beautiful words, Mary Magdalene had moments of doubt and depression over the crucifixion of her Lord. Mary Magdalene had been delivered from seven devils. She had a great experience with Christ and she loved her Lord. And as she came to the tomb, the angels questioned Mary, why weepest thou? Mary's moments of doubt and depression. She weeps for her Savior. Mary doubted the Lord's promise. The Lord said, I would come back in three days. She must have doubted that for a moment. Mary doubted the Lord's power to be able to come back to life for a moment. Mary doubted the Lord's presence. Mary, like many, are defeated by their doubts. How many of us, at one time or another, in situations of life, we can have our doubts and be defeated by our doubts. She believed in Christ. She had been delivered by Christ. Sometimes in deep sorrow and sometimes in deep emotion it has a way of blinding us to the presence and power of God. We've all been there and we may be there again. But Mary's moments of doubt and depression is a, is a warning for us all. Mary turns and sees Jesus, but does not recognize him. It's amazing. In our times of difficulty, in our times of sorrow, in our difficult times of life, we just don't see the Lord Jesus. We just don't understand that his power is great enough for us. But then Christ spoke to her that one word, Mary, and spoke her name. And it seems like just speaking her name, that one word, Mary, Mary's res response in John 20, 16, Rabboni, my master, in the original Greek. One word from that still, small voice can change our whole outlook. One word from the Lord can change our whole perspective of life. Whether it comes from the scriptures. How many times have you been reading the scriptures and you've read this verse a hundred times. But all of a sudden, on this day, at this time, it just leaps off the page at you. It's that rhema word. That logos becomes that rhema. It becomes alive. And it just speaks to our spirit so powerfully. That one word, Jesus spoke to Mary. Mary. And she recognized, Rabona, my master, changed everything. The power of the resurrection is the fulfillment and demonstration of almighty power. It was God's new standard of power. In the Old Testament, when he walled up the water in the Red Sea and they walked upon dry ground, that was a demonstration of God's power. And that was amazing. But when Christ was raised from the dead, it was a demonstration, a new level of power demonstrated. 
almighty power. The great almighty power. Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Amen. He did that. We see the power of the Son. We see the power of the Father. We see the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Son. Therefore doth my Father love me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No man takes it from me but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. Wow. The purpose of him laying down his life was the purpose of the incarnation. He came, he came to live, and he came to die. But he picked his life up again because he had the power, the power of the Son. The power of the Father is illustrated in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe? Wow. He gives us power to live to us who believe. I said he gives us power to live for Christ. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power? This prayer of the Apostle Paul is referred to as a prayer you can't live without. This prayer of the Apostle Paul in verse 19, he uses four distinct Greek words. He uses the word dunamis. Dunamis power, iskus, kantos, and anarchia. Four different Greek words that illustrate different aspects of God's power. In one little verse 19, let's look at that. Therefore doth my Father love me, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him on the right hand in heavenly places. Somebody say amen to God. Four different Greek words that Paul uses to illustrate that different aspects of God's power. Then in Romans 1, 4, the power of the Holy Spirit and declared to be the Son of God with the power by the Spirit of holiness, the Spirit of God, by the resurrection from the dead. The power of the resurrection was almighty power. And the power of the resurrection was amazing power. Come on. Do you think it was an amazing power? Yes. There is no hope apart from the resurrection. Let me say that again. There is no hope apart from the resurrection. We were all spiritually dead, but now we have been quickened. Quickened is a resurrection term. Made alive who were dead in our trespasses and sins of Ephesians 2.1. All who come to Christ are made alive by this amazing power. How many are glad that you are alive spiritually? And sometimes you feel like you need the, the glorified body now. But, you know, everybody needs a glorified body sometime or another. And sometime in the morning I feel like I need one. But God's power is amazing power. God's power is almighty power. And this is the part I really like. God's power is available. Amen. It's available power. God has made resurrection power available to all of us who believe. The same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you and I. We know that according to Romans 8.11. That same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us. Wow. I love it. Listen. If you're tired and weak, as I am sometimes, it's time to stand up and walk in resurrection power. Come on. If you are tempted, which we all are, it's time to overcome with the resurrection power of God. If you are depressed, sometimes we have been, it's time to stand up in resurrection power. 
If you are defeated, it's time to claim resurrection power for victory. Because the resurrection power of God is almighty, it is amazing, and it is available. Come on. It's available. Resurrection power is mighty. It's amazing and it's available to keep those who are saved and give us power to live for the risen Christ. If Jesus rose from the dead, you can get out of bed and you can live a victorious Christian life every day. And I, I believe that is true. There's some mornings it takes the resurrection power to get us up and get us going. In closing on this concerning the Holy Week and the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there's something that's kind of amazing to be thought of <coughs> during Holy Week, which we've looked past this week and we've talked about it. Pilate didn't seem to know what was happening. He had no idea he was sending to the cross the Savior of the world. Herod did not know what was happening. He thought his puny guards could keep Jesus in the tomb. I don't think so. I don't think so. These were very important men who had very important positions, but they didn't know what was going on. They didn't know what was happening. Now, this gets a little bit more personal. The women who followed Christ, who had been delivered by Christ, didn't know what was happening. They were buying new spices further for embalming. They're going to go and put some more spices on him, on his body, on his dead body. And then, Mark 16, 3, as they were headed with the new spices, they were wondering how they were going to get into him because of the stone that was stopping them maybe to get to him. So Pilate didn't know what was going on, what was happening. Herod didn't know what was happening. The women that loved Christ did not know what was happening. And then we get down to the disciples. They didn't seem to know what was happening. Some said we had hope. They had put their hope in the past tense, for heaven's sakes. Some apostles heard of the resurrection and their response in Luke 24, 11 seemed to them like nonsense. They didn't believe it. So, Pilate didn't know what was going on. Herod didn't know. The women didn't know. The disciples seemed not to know what was going on. Holy Week. The cross. Man. Sometimes I wonder today, how many people don't know what's going on? They don't know what's going on. Man, I tell you what, I have never been more concerned or disappointed in what's happening in our country, in our culture. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing, it really is. <coughs> And I, I, I consider myself a patriot. I consider myself a good citizen. I pay my taxes like you guys. And I, I, I love my country. But I am very saddened because I know what's going on. And I wonder how many people actually do know what's going on. We, 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 we are stunned when we hear our leaders say things that just are against the things that God has laid down to be right and we I think we kind of know what's right and what's not right and there's a lot of things that are just going on that are just against the teachings of the scriptures and what God has said should be and I think that when Christ returns and the resurrection of believers takes place a lot of people are going to be wiped out and survive because they didn't know what was going on they didn't know what was happening. And they're going to be surprised by the resurrection of those that are resurrected at the time of Christ's return. And it, it, just, it just breaks your heart. It's past time for believers to take a stand 
for what is righteous. It's past time for believers to stand up for what is right and for what is biblical, for what is true, and for what the gospel teaches us and what the word teaches us. We've got to know what's happening. We've got to lift up our hands for our resurrection and our redemption is drawing near. It's time to pay attention to what's going on in your culture. Because I think we're moving in a time where we're very close to the coming of the Lord. And it's time to know what's going on. And it's time to be aware. Jesus Christ rose from the dead and Jesus Christ is coming again. He said he would rise in three days and he rose in three days. He said he's coming back and he's coming back. And Luke, and Luke 21, 28, when you see these things begin to come to pass, lift up your head, look up, for our redemption draws near. Know what's happening in your world. One thing I make, I make it very sure, every day I try to find out what's going on in the world. I want to be aware of what's going on. Joe sent me something from Amir Shafati, right from Israel, telling us firsthand what was happening in Israel last night. What's happening in the world. You got to know what's going on. You got to be looking. Christ is coming for three kinds of people. For the Catholics, the Presbyterians, and the Pentecostals. No. He's coming for those who look for his appearing. He's coming for those who love his appearing. And those who are ready for his appearing in the clouds. Let's stand together. He's alive. He's alive. Play it loud and let's rejoice. Fastened down. I spent the night in sleeplessness, rose at every sound, half in hopeless sorrow, half in fear the day would find the soldiers breaking through to drag us all away. Just before the sunrise, I heard something at the wall. The gate began to rattle, a voice began to call. I hurried to the window and looked down into the street, expecting swords and torches and the sound of soldiers' feet. But there was no one there but Mary, so I went down to let her in. John stood there beside me as she told us where she'd been. She said they've moved him in the night, none of us knows where. Stones been rolled away. Now his body isn't there. We both ran toward the garden, and John ran on ahead. We found the stone in the empty tomb, just the way that Mary said. The winding sheet they wrapped him in was just an empty shell. How or where they'd taken him was more than I could tell. Something strange had happened there, but just what, I did not know. John believed a miracle, but I just turned to go. Circumstance and speculation couldn't lift me very high. Cause I'd seen them crucify him, then I saw him die. Inside the house again, the guilt and anguish came. Everything I had promised him just added to my shame. Cause when at last it came, the choices I denied, I knew his name. Even if he was alive, it wouldn't be the same. But suddenly the air was filled with strange and sweet perfume Light that came from everywhere drove shadows from the room 
Jesus stood before me with his arms held open wide. I fell down on my knees and just clung to him and cried. He raised me to my feet as I looked into his eyes. Love was shining out from him like sunlight from the skies. Guilt in my confusion disappeared in sweet release. And every fear I'd ever had just melted into peace.
and we honor the Lord God of our salvation in this church today. We honor you and we give you praise and we live for you. We choose to live the life of righteousness because of the cross. And you give us resurrection power to live, power to live right. And we thank you in Christ's name. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. You can't die right unless you live right. And listen, the resurrection power of Christ gives us the power to live for the Lord every day. If Jesus rose from the dead, you can get out of bed and live for Christ. God bless you and be sure to greet each one in the name of the Lord. Amen.